Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Dr. Mark Soleil, Dr. Stacy McDonald, and Dr. Allison Slack. Dr. Soleil completed his undergraduate education at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. He earned his Doctor of Medicine degree with honors from the University of Toronto in Ontario. He then performed postgraduate training in urology at the University of Ottawa, also in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Soleil is board certified with the American Board of Urology and is certified in urology as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada. Dr. Soleil currently practices medicine with Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Dr. Allison Slack received her Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Michigan. She attended medical school at University of Texas Southwestern Medical School before completing her residency at the University of Connecticut. She is board certified with the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Slack's special interests include minimally invasive laparoscopic and vaginal surgery, general and high-risk obstetrics, pelvic pain syndromes, and bladder control issues. Dr. Slack currently practices medicine with the Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Dr. Stacy McDonald received her bachelor's degree at Binghamton University in New York. She attended medical school at St. George's University School of Medicine before completing her residency at Robert Wood Johnson University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey Cooper Hospital. Dr. McDonald is board certified with the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She currently practices medicine with the Washington Township Medical Foundation in Fremont. Good evening everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. So obviously you could tell we're going to be talking about urinary incontinence. There's uh, many different kinds of incontinence, many different causes for incontinence and various treatments depending on the cause and on patient preference and we're going to outline all of those today. So what is incontinence? Simply, it is leakage of urine that is out of your control and that can cause some inconvenience, causes an issue with hygiene, maybe infections, embarrassment, limiting your activities. It increases with age. Obviously, the older you are, the more common it is, but it's never considered normal, not, not a normal part of aging. And if it bothers you, it should be treated and can be treated. About 13 million Americans are afflicted with incontinence, and most of those are women, but many men obviously are uh, affected as well. Statistics show that about 50% of women at some point in their lives will have some episode of leakage. It may be temporary, but they will. 20% of women between the ages of 15 and 64, and much more prevalent after that. In the, elder, in the elderly, it's, uh, it's about 50% on a regular basis. Urinary incontinence is often underdiagnosed and undertreated, and the reasons for that are many. Primary care physicians may be uncomfortable talking about it or untrained in talking about it. Definitely, patients may be embarrassed about the, bringing up the issue, and if it's not brought up for them, they, or if the environment is not comfortable for them to bring up the issue, it's never addressed and it's never treated. And the sad thing is that most cases of incontinence can be treated successfully if they're addressed. So why is it important? Why is urinary incontinence an issue? It's still a social stigma. Even though a lot of people talk about it a lot more often now, it still causes a lot of embarrassment. So that limits people's activities, their socialization with their friends, their ability to go to work. It can cause medical con complications. If you're constantly wet, it may cause skin breakdown. It may cause rashes, bladder infections as a result of the, the, the pads being constantly against the urethra. 
And it could also cause fractures and falls when somebody is rushing to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or, or even at the mall. It is one of the leading causes of placement in a nursing home. If somebody can't take care of themselves and their caregivers find that it's too burdensome to take care of the incontinence issue, that might be just one more factor leading to that person being placed in a nursing home instead of staying in their home. It can affect people's work, time off work, embarrassment at work, and limiting their productivity. And of course, issues at home with the cost of, of incontinence pads, the laundry, changing clothes, etc. What causes incontinence? Many things. There's a lot of abbreviations here, and we're going to explain some of them a little bit later on. Stress urinary incontinence, that's incontinence caused by physical activity, pressure, coughing, lifting, etc., pressure on the bladder. Urge urinary incontinence is usually associated with a sudden urge and an uncontrollable bladder contraction. Mixed incontinence is usually a combination of those two things. Functional incontinence has more to do with the person not being able to make it to the bathroom on time because of limited mobility or maybe because of their mental status, not being aware of their bladder, even if the bladder is otherwise normal. Overflow incontinence is more common in men. It has to do more with somebody being in retention and the bladder is so full that they dribble urine constantly. They're overflowing from their bladder. Other more rare causes have to do with either congenital problems or maybe post-surgical or post-radiation problems that lead to an abnormal connection of the bladder to the outside called a fistula. Maybe there's well, an ectopic ureter is extremely rare. Again, that's an abnormal connection to the outside where there's constant leakage. Medications are a very common cause of incontinence. Diuretics or water pills are often used for swelling of the ankles or for blood pressure treatment. They can simply make the person produce so much urine, which is their job, but it can overwhelm the bladder's uh, normal capacity and make them leak. Anticholinergic medications are often used for various things, including treating bladder conditions, but they can also lead to urinary retention and overflow leakage. Sedatives, alcohol, narcotics often work the same way by, in a way, numbing the bladder and uh, reducing bladder sensation, reducing bladder muscle function, and causing retention or leakage as a result. Various other medications that are used for blood pressure medications mostly can also lead to weakening of the sphincter muscle or even aggravation of the bladder contractions themselves leading to leakage. So if you're on a first name basis with your toilet, you probably have a problem. Urge incontinence is one of those conditions that we talked about. It's defined as a sudden uncontrollable urge to void, lead and then followed immediately by leakage. So your bladder gives you a little bit of a warning that it's going to contract but then it doesn't wait for your permission. It goes ahead and pushes that urine out against your will. And usually this is a large amount of leakage. The bladder almost empties completely, depending on the severity of the problem. And this could be one of the worst kinds of leakage that you have. It can be caused by anything that irritates the bladder, whether that's infections, bladder stones, even tumors or cancer. And it can be caused by neurological conditions, at which point we might call it a neurogenic bladder. Strokes, uh, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, all those things can lead to bladder dysfunction and, and leakage as a result. Overactive bladder is one of those conditions. There's a lot of things that can cause overactive bladder. A lot of times it's idiopathic, meaning we just don't know exactly what causes it. It is extremely common. 33 million people in the U.S. have it. More common than asthma and heart disease combined, I believe. And the symptoms of an overactive bladder itself is basically frequency, urgency, running to the bathroom frequently, getting up at night to urinate. And those symptoms can occur by themselves, and by themselves can be bothersome enough that they require treatment, but they can also occur with urinary incontinence. And that's when it's called overactive bladder with urge incontinence. And similarly to incontinence in general, it really can impact the quality of life in a lot of, a lot of ways, especially when it's associated with incontinence, can lead to hospitalization, falls, etc. Treatment of overactive bladder is mostly medical. You have to treat the underlying condition, rule out infection, rule out neurological conditions, treat bladder stones, etc. Everybody else, once you rule those out, has an idiopathic overactive bladder that requires medication. And th these medications don't cure the condition, unfortunately. It's kind of a chronic condition that you take the medication, just like you, you would take a blood pressure medication on a regular basis to control it and keep it under, under control. Most of these medications that are listed up here are in the same category. They're called anticholinergic medications that work on one type of receptor. And that's what we've had for decades 
they all basically work the same way and they can't be combined with each other. You would try one and switch to another one if one doesn't work, whether it's because of cost, formulary coverage, or because of the side effects. The side effects of these medications include, are, are very similar, and they include dry mouth, constipation, dry eyes, and sometimes can even lead to cognitive changes. It can cause memory loss and confusion. And for, for that reason, they really shouldn't be used in certain conditions, like Parkinson's and, and in, in some elderly patients as well who may have some element of dementia. Merbetric, the bottom one, is a relatively new medication that's been out for a couple of years, and it works on the beta receptors in the bladder, very different from the others. From that standpoint, it doesn't have the same side effects. It doesn't affect the salivary gland or bowel function, doesn't affect cognitive function, but it can affect the circulatory system. It can cause a uh, fast heart rate or high blood pressure. If it doesn't cause those side effects, it works well, and it can be combined with those other medications if necessary, which is also good for patients with really severe symptoms. Moving on to stress incontinence, that's the other major category of leakage. This is leakage that's caused by a sudden pressure on the bladder, usually an abdominal contraction from coughing or sneezing or from lifting a heavy object, bending or changing body position. Even just rising from a sitting position, for example, can cause a leakage. And it has mainly to do with not so much the bladder itself, but the bladder outlet. The opening of the bladder, the urethra, is weak. The sphincter muscle is weak and not holding the bladder contents in place like it should. Most cases, this leakage is just a sudden little squirt, and it's not as severe as the overactive bladder, but still obviously bothersome enough. It can be caused by various things, anything that can make the pelvic floor weaker, that can cause the vaginal wall, the anterior vaginal wall below the bladder to sag or weaken. In men, it can be caused after, usually after prostate surgery, um, su such as a radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer. The clinical evaluation for any type of incontinence is the same. The doctor is going to take a history, going to ask you about your medical conditions and medications that you take, etc. They're going to do a physical exam, which will include a pelvic examination. We may do urodynamics. This is an objective test that will, it's a very comprehensive test that can test the bladder capacity, the bladder muscle, how stable the bladder muscle is, does it contract involuntarily, how good is the sphincter muscle. If you have stress incontinence, we can try and replicate it in the office and we will test exactly how much pressure it takes for you to leak, which will help us uh, guide what kind of treatment you need, if you need a sling, how tight to make it, et cetera. So it's very important. Uh, other tests may include blood tests to test your kidney function. Uh, make sure you don't have diabetes if that's been undiagnosed. Test the urine for signs of infection. And then a cystoscopy may be performed. This is a test where we put a camera into the bladder under local anesthesia in the office. And it's mainly used to rule out say, something like a bladder stone or bladder cancer if you have blood in the urine, and also to plan surgery. If you're planning any invasive management, it's often done as a precursor to that. Treatments for stress urinary incontinence. We should always start with the behavioral changes. Losing weight is always important. Even a few pounds can make a difference on how much pressure is applied to that bladder. Using what's called timed voiding. Basically, if you notice that you leak, if your bladder has, say, two cups of urine in it, maybe keep it under that, keep it under its capacity. So be, set your timer and go to the bathroom every two hours or whatever it, whatever it takes before your bladder gets to that point where you might leak. Constipation is important to treat because the bowel, the rectum is very close to the bladder. They're physically related, they're neurologically related, and a really distended, constipated rectum can affect the bladder in a lot of ways. It can cause infections and lead to incontinence. Stopping smoking is important for a lot of reasons, but also to reduce cough avoiding high-impact activities and heavy lifting. That's, you know, we don't want to limit activities too much. We want to fix the incontinence so you can move on with your life. Kegel exercises, that's the pelvic floor exercises that I'll describe in a bit. There are non-surgical options that are minimally invasive, such as placing a pessary, which is a little device that's placed in the vagina to lift the pelvic prolapse that may be changing the bladder anatomy and leading to the leakage. And there are the surgical options if all else fails. Kegel exercises or pelvic floor exercises, it's important to do them correctly. You want to be contracting the pelvic muscles that are surrounding the urethra and the vagina, not the thigh muscles, not the abdominal muscles. And it's an isometric exercise. There's lots of ways to describe it, but basically you want to contract those muscles around the sphincter, hold them for as long as you can, usually just a few seconds, relax, and repeat. Do a set of 10 or 20 several times a day whenever you think of it. 
And like any exercise program, the more you do it, the more effectively you do it, the better the muscles will get. And this, will, this is probably a good idea for any type of leakage. It'll, it may cure some of the more minor leakage, but it'll also make other treatments more effective if you, if you perform this regularly. These are examples of the pessaries. This is the bladder. That's the urethra. This is the uterus and the vagina. And the vaginal wall right here below the bladder might be weak and causing the bladder to fall down, which would open up the bladder neck. Placing the pessary up here helps support the pelvic organs and keep the normal anatomy, which may by itself treat the more minor leakage. Surgical treatments. If you get to that point, you've tried everything else and it fails, then there are various ways to treat this. An anterior vaginal repair is performed to treat a, the same condition as what a pessary would be treating, but more severe or if the pessary doesn't work. It's basically tightening up the vaginal wall below the bladder. It supports the bottom of the bladder and helps maintain the normal anatomy. In needle suspension, these are older ways of doing it. I don't think anybody's doing that anymore, but it involves putting needles in from above to around the bladder, leaving stitches in place, and then cutting off the excess. A retropubic urethropexy, a birch or a Marshall Marchetti Krantz. This involves an abdominal incision and involves putting stitches on either side of the bladder and the urethra and then lifting them up to the normal where they should be and fixing them to the pelvic sidewall. And I'll show you a picture of that in a bit. Urethral slings or mid-urethral slings are the most common way to treat this nowadays. They're minimally invasive. They're done as an outpatient with very small vaginal incisions. Rarely do you, do you need even any abdominal incisions at all. They're very effective and long-lasting. Injecting of a bulking agent, such as collagen or some synthetic version of collagen, is also another way of doing that. That can be done with a camera, with a scope, with either local anesthesia or minimal general anesthesia. And you basically inject material into the urethra, into the passageway, to bulk it up so that the, the sides are touching now, causing some resistance to the leakage. Again, this would maybe for somebody who is not a surgical kind of candidate for the bigger procedures or maybe for more minor leakage, and it, and it can work. The thing about it is it can be temporary and may have to be redone every several months to kind of increase the bulking. The artificial sphincter really applies only to males. That's for men who have had a radical prostatectomy, had their prostate removed for prostate cancer and are still leaking. And it's, it's basically an artificial way of replacing their natural sphincter by placing a device around the urethra. But it's, it's more of a complicated thing involving a reservoir of fluid and, and a little pump that they have to operate manually. This is the retropubic or the, the abdominal surgery that we talked about, the Birch procedure. The head is this way, the feet are this way. This is the pubic bone. There's the urethra. You can see the impression of a catheter inside the bladder. The stitches are placed on either side and then fixed to the pelvic sidewall, and that lifts the bladder up. But it is a rather major surgery with a big incision and healing that would take up to six weeks. The mid-urethral slings are, as I mentioned, can be performed as an outpatient procedure. It literally takes about 10 to 20 minutes of surgical time, fast recovery, and then you go straight home and the results are immediate. There is some limitations in your activities afterwards, of course, to allow for the healing, but much less so than an abdominal surgery. This is a demonstration of how these slings work. This is your pelvic bone, this is the bladder, and the urethra going underneath. <coughs> when you cough or sneeze, pressure is applied to the bladder, making the urethra open or to move, causing the leakage. The sling can be placed underneath, like a hammock, underneath that urethra, so when the pressure is applied, that urethra is supported from below, you don't have that abnormal opening, and then that restores normal contents. This is another version of it. Again, there's the urethra, bladder, this is the vagina. This is the sling material that's placed through the pubic bones and the pelvis through a small incision right here, and that helps support the urethra and stop the leakage. The same thing can be done through a suprapubic approach. It's a different way of doing it. Say if you failed the observator approach, tiny little incisions are made in the abdomen, and the same type of sling is placed at a different angle, and that may work better for some people. So again, slings versus other surgical interventions are more minimally invasive, just as effective at least, and definitely more durable than a bulking agent or the collagen. So in summary, incontinence is common. It can impact your life in many ways. It can be treated, 
There are conservative ways of doing it, and there are various surgical options depending on your preference and your condition. Thank you for listening. So I'm just going to present another option for treatment of overactive bladder that we, Dr. McDonald and I have started doing in our practice about two years ago. And it's another option that a lot of people haven't heard about, and so that's why I wanted to kind of give you a little information here today. Dr. Soleil talked about overactive bladder and urgent continence, and the mainstay of therapy for a long time has been medications. Medications have been shown to have a really poor history of compliance, meaning that patients, if they don't get a good response or if they have a lot of side effects, often will stop taking it after several weeks or months, or they take it intermittently throughout their lives. And then other patients who have a lot of side effects or can't take medications have to go through either have to deal with the overactive bladder and it really affects their lives or have to go into more serious treatment options like surgery, which can be quite invasive. So several years ago, they developed another option called percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation or urgent PC. And it's an option kind of between conservative management like behavioral modification, dietary changes, pelvic floor muscle exercises, bladder retraining, and then surgery, and medications and surgery. So PTNS is also referred to as percutaneous tibial nerve, posterior tibial nerve, but it's marketed as urgent PC, which is done by the Congenics Medical, and there's the website there if people want some information on that. And this is a nice option for patients who haven't been, either have tried medication and then it's not working for them, or have significant side effects like dry mouth, constipation, things of that nature, or they don't want to take drugs. I have quite a few patients who don't like the idea of taking medications every day, or they have other contraindications to medication like dementia or acute angle glaucoma or things of that nature, and then people who also are not willing to go through surgical treatment for the overactive bladder. And what we do is basically it's a series of 12 treatments that are done in the office. They're 30-minute sessions where we stimulate the posterior tibial nerve, and I'll sh show you pictures on, on how that's done. That we do ask patients to commit to 12 sessions of treatment. Most patients will see improvement in about five to seven sessions. And I've had people see treat, uh, improvement in early as three or four and then as late as eight, eight or nine. Medicare does cover this, so that's always a question that a lot of patients have. And it is found to be an effective treatment option for patients for reducing their symptoms. And the biggest thing I find helpful for this and that a lot of patients really like is there's really very minimal to, to zero risk. Because it is a non-invasive office procedure, there's you know, really no risk of significant side effects or complications from the procedure itself. So basically, this is a patient who is having her urgent PC treatment done. She's just sitting there comfortably reading. I have quite a few patients where I get lots of good book recommendations because they're always like, where are you in your book now? <laughs> because they read it every week and I check in with them. I keep on saying I'm going to have a book club. This is the neuromodulation system. So basically, we place an acupuncture needle that's attached to an electrode clip, which is an attack to this battery-operated neurostimulator. And so the electrode is inserted near the ankle area. So it's just at the base of the lower leg. And then we attach it to the electrode, and that's attached to the stimulator. The reason that this works is that the posterior tibial nerve goes up and comes out of the same nerve root plexus as the nerves that inter innervate the bladder. So you get this nerve stimulation that goes all the way up to the sacral nerve roots, and you get cross stimulation of the sacral nerves that innervate the bladder. Side effects, as I was mentioning, are close to none. Basically, the similar side effects, if any of you have ever had acupuncture before, that you would get with acupuncture. So maybe a little bit of irritation at the needle site, maybe a little, literally like a pin prick of blood, or some mild pain or inflammation at that area. Very few contraindications to urgent PC, essentially pregnancy, because nobody wants to check any of these things in pregnancy, as well as a pacemaker or an implant of defibrillator use, history of excessive bleeding, although it would have to be pretty significant because, again, the risks of bleeding are close to zero. And then the, but the biggest issue is nerve damage. So people who have peripheral nerve damage, say from diabetes, or who have a neurogenic bladder and their, their bladder issues are because of some sacral nerve issues, those patients are not going to respond to this type of therapy.
As far as the effectiveness, and we'll get this gets a little bit more into kind of the data for people who are interested in that. There have been over 30 plus peer reviewed publications on this treatment option, and they have shown both reduced urgency, incontinence episodes, and frequency, also reduced episodes of getting up at nighttime. These have been checked at both objective, so with with bladder diaries and people log and women and men logging their their leakage episodes as well as urgency episodes as well as kind of subjective marks on how, do they feel it just feel better after ta after going through the treatment and this is a series of seven studies where you see between 60 and 80 percent of patients have found that they feel that this treatment has improved or cured their overactive bladder and this was comparing it to medication. So as Dr. Saleh was saying, that the mainstay for a long period of time has been medications. And one of the most common medications that people take is Detrol. And this is comparing Detrol to TNS or urgent PC. And there is a comparison here of basically looking at the blue column is the response to urgent PC and the orange or yellow column is the response to medication. So basically, patients seem to respond as well to this as they do to medications for both number of voiding per day, number of urgency episodes, as well as improvement of their nighttime voiding. So this is a 12-week therapy program, but they have followed patients as long as 12 months and looking at longer-term data. And you can see that there's improvement with TNS for both frequency, nighttime voids, urgency episodes, improved voiding volume, meaning that people can hold their urine longer, and decreased incontinence episodes during the day, as well as quality of life measures, just feeling that their life has improved. And then as far as the long-term data, they did a study looking at, again, urgent PC versus medication and thought about 90% of participants continued treatments up for six months and then 73% continued treatments for 12 months and they saw sustained improvement for up to, actually up to three years. And so initially, as I was saying, you, you do come in once a week. What the, the, the protocol that this study did was that from three to six months, they, patients came in every two weeks, and then after six months, they came in essentially once a month. I have been finding that some, a lot of my patients will do the 12-week treatment protocol, and then I check in with them about a month, about three to five weeks later to see how they're doing. And a lot of patients will be doing fine then, and they'll just wait, and they'll not you know, they'll say, okay, I'll see how things go, and maybe in six months or a year, they do another 12-week protocol. I have other patients who find after about three or four weeks, they start to feel that their symptoms are starting to come back a little bit, and I, I have a lot of patients who are doing basically a one-month kind of maintenance regimen, and they seem to do really, really well with that. And again, this is kind of reviewing that about 60% of patients with overactive bladder do respond to this therapy, and the results were stable after three-year follow-up time, with only 10% of patients showing that the initial results that they had received had decreased. So basically 90% of patients still having improvement at three years. And now uh, they're also looking at PTNS in other causes of basically fecal issues and constipation, incomplete bladder emptying, and as well as some chronic pelvic pains. I've had one or two patients who've also had some pain issues, pelvic pain issues, and have undergone PTNS for overactive bladder, and they've actually kind of, it's kind of coincidentally, they've seen some improvement of their pelvic pain, so that's something that they're investigating this as a treatment option for. And that is the end of that. So I'd like to welcome our panelists, which is, again, Dr. Mark Soleil, Dr. Allison Slack, and please welcome Dr. Stacy McDonald. And the first question is, how do you decide if you really have a problem, a urinary incontinence problem? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so how do you decide if this is a problem? That's what I ask my patients a lot when they come to see me, and we'll talk about their bladder control. Are they leaking? Is it bothersome? When it's time for treatment, it's you know because you are talking about it. If it's not bothering you, you're not thinking about it. You shouldn't be thinking about your bladder all the time. You shouldn't be thinking how many bathrooms are there from here to Safeway. Do I know where every bathroom in Fremont is between here and Costco? If you're thinking about, I know where all the bathrooms are because I've visited most of them and whenever I make my route, it's probably time to start considering some kind of treatment. So when we talk about the different treatments, the other thing that I speak with my patients frequently about 
is how much of a problem is it for you? Because for me, it's not a problem, right? You come, you talk to me, and, and we can talk and, and discuss all of the options. That's not a problem. We have all the time we need to talk about that. It's once you leave and go home, how is this affecting your life? And that's when you know it's a problem because it is affecting my life. I'm thinking about, did I bring a change of clothes when I was going to go to this party? Or I can't go to that reunion in Sacramento because it's just a little bit too far on the highway. Here's another question that I received. Can incontinence come and go? Some weeks I have, a prob I have problems, and there are some that I do not have a problem. So this is a general yeah, question. It would be for all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, the answer is yes. So incontinence can come and go. And the reason is some of the things we outlined on the, on the slides, um, it can be functional. So if there's a day where you are drinking uh, a gallon of coffee uh, for one reason or another, that's going to make you produce more urine and you're going to have more incontinence. If you're taking a new medication, if you're taking an over-the-counter medication for a cold or something along those lines that may impact your bladder, it can cause uh, incontinence. Your fluid intake in general, your alcohol intake, um, et cetera, all that can affect it. So the simple answer is yes, you can have good and bad days. What is a normal time between voiding? What is the normal time be between going to the restroom? Again, it, as Dr. McDonald and Dr. Soleil kind of uh, alluded to, it's, it's very uh, subjective. It's really what's comfortable for you. Normal is anywhere, voiding anywhere from five to eight times daily. And at nighttime, normal is considered any, getting up at night once or twice a night. So, you know, for people who are finding they have to go to the bathroom half an hour, an hour, um, that sort of thing, every, you know, they, they, like as Dr. McDonald's saying, they can't sit through a movie without having to get up to go, even if they went to the bathroom right before, that would be more abnormal. But the real issue is how much it's affecting your life and how, you know, how much, you know, you want to look at what, you know, how to modify things. So I had, I had a patient in the past who, she kept on having to get up at night every time, like four or five times a night, and it finally, after about the third or fourth visit, she admitted, well, she has, you know, she's German, she has to have three or four beers at night before she goes to bed. <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, I don't know if any of what we're talking about is going to help unless you cut back on the beer at bedtime. <laughs> and she said, well, I don't think I can do that. And I'm like, okay, well, then we're going to have to talk about how we're going to deal with you getting up three or four times at night. because." I'm, I don't think I'm going to be able to help you unless you cut back to maybe one beer at bed. Uh. So, you know, it, it really is a matter of what, um, you know, how your life, you want to modify your life to improve things. But, you know, there's lots of different things, as we, we've noted here, that we can do to help. You talked about diagnostic testing. Um, do these tests require any special preparation? Usually not. So, obviously, any of the tests we can perform in the office is just like a regular office visit. It's a physical exam. The blood tests, the urine tests don't require any fasting or anything special. Uh, the cystoscopy and the urodynamics also, no prior preparation. We will give you antibiotics afterwards for some of the more invasive procedures like the urodynamics to prevent an infection, but otherwise no preparation. You also mentioned that weight loss um, helps improve in urinary incontinence. How much weight loss should a patient lose? So see if you agree with me, that, that's really going to depend on the individual and how motivated you are because as Dr. Soleil was alluding to before, even several pounds can have a large impact. The, the weight in our bodies, in our stomachs, are, is pushing on the bladder. So when we're coughing and sneezing, that weight is moving and pushing. So if you're someone who is just a few pounds overweight, a few pounds will probably make a difference. Someone who is more than a few pounds overweight a few pounds will still make a difference. Okay, that when, when that's a little bit lighter, it's a little bit less of a push. And I've seen patients have significant improvement with weight loss. Mm -hmm. it, really remarkable. Yeah, I, I definitely encourage patients to, especially patients who are obese or morbidly obese and are considering surgical options, I really encourage them to look at weight loss first because, A, they may have significant improvement of their symptoms just with losing even 5 to 10 percent of their body weight if you're in, even, you know, if you're in an obese or morbidly obese category. So 
um, that can help in and of itself. And if you're going to have uh, surgery, there are a higher rate of surgical complications and less chance of surgery being successful in patients who are morbidly obese. So A, you may just losing weight may help 50 plus even, you know, even cure your symptoms. And if you, if it doesn't, you're going to be in a better situation for surgery itself. So there's a better chance that that surgery is going to be successful for you and you're going to have less complications from it. Here's another question. If I have other health conditions, such as diabetes, how can I best manage these conditions together? Well, controlling your diabetes or any other medical condition uh, should always be number one. And when you control those conditions, that's going to make your bladder better. If your bladder, if your diabetes is out of control, you're going to be producing too much urine, for example, and that's going to overwhelm your bladder and cause more leakage. Also, if your diabetes is out of control, you're not going to be a good candidate for, for surgery, for example. You're more likely to have complications or infections. So medical conditions can make the bladder condition worse, and treating the medical conditions can make the bladder condition better. And there's really, the answer is just treat them as well as you can and just follow your doctor's directions, the doctor that's taking care of that condition. Question from the audience. What is QOL? Patients with diabetes have been QOL rather than O-A-B. Oh, so QOL was in, I think it was, might have been my slide, so it's quality of life. Oh. So basically, the, a lot of the, the studies in incontinence look at quality of life because um, this is, you know, incontinence, as much as it affects so many people and it can really affect their lives, it's, it's not going to imp increase morbidity for the vast majority of patients. It's not going to, it's, it's not going to kill you. It's just going to make your life not a whole lot of fun to live. So a lot of the studies on incontinence are done on quality of life measures, which are a little bit more difficult to study because they're very subjective. But this, it's about, again, improving your life and making it a, a better life to live. So I think in one of my slides, it actually showed that in one study, the quality of life, so they sent out these questionnaires to patients, and they tested, you know, how good is your quality of life? You know, is it miserable? Is it really good? Can you live this way for a long time? And they, they sent the same questionnaire to diabetics who have to modify their diet and take medication or take insulin, and to patients with urinary incontinence and overactive bladder. And they found that the patients with the bladder condition had a worse quality of life than the diabetics. So that was just a demonstration of how the, you know, bladder condition, even though it won't kill you, can affect your quality of mm -hmm. life. Does pregnancy leave a lasting problem with urinary incontinence? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can. Um, however, they've also shown in studies that having a cesarean section in order to avoid those complications is not always successful. Oh, it doesn't work. So we don't recommend cesarean sections. Uh, in order to prevent bladder problems. Yeah, some of the latest data say there's really no difference. It's pregnancy itself. You have, again, increased weight, um, not just from the baby, but just the weight gain. And then, you know, the, the weight of the, the baby literally sitting right on top of your bladder. It will almost always, I'd say about 75 or 80 percent of my patients will have some degree of incontinence during pregnancy itself. If you really ask them about, I would say, 80% or more, uh, but most of those will improve, but it, it never goes back to normal. I don't have leakage, but in the past year, I've begun to experience a pretty consistent urge to urinate and feel that I have to use the toilet frequently. Would Kegels help address this condition? One of the behavioral modifications that you can do um, is bladder training, and part of that is if you've gone to the bathroom recently, say you know, you've know you gone to the bathroom a half hour ago, and you know you don't have any medical condition, you're not taking a diuretic, you know your bladder cannot be filled, it's only been a half an hour, and you feel like you need to go. Um, doing some quick Kegel squeezes can help to hold the urine to allow that bladder spasm to pass and kind of retrain your bladder to not pay attention to those little spasms. And a lot of patients find that both looking at their their diet and, you know, especially alcohol and caffeine intake, the amount of fluids that they're drinking, because a lot of people are actually drinking probably too, too much, you know, you, you hear you're supposed to drink, oh, 10, 12 glasses of water a day. That can put a lot of strain on your bladder as well. But, and, and then doing Kegel exercises to allow those spasms to pass. They, a lot of patient, my patients do very well with just those kind of conservative treatment options and kind of reteaching their bladder who's in charge. Don't let the bladder be in charge.
And one thing that I would say about Kegel's exercises is for some people who try and do them, it seems very intuitive. They read the instructions, they figure it out, they isolate the muscles, and you know they're off and running with their Kegel's exercises. For other women who are trying to do these exercises, it's not so self-evident. They haven't practiced squeezing in this area. They're not quite sure, and as Dr. Slay was talking about, it's not squeezing our thigh muscles, it's not squeezing our abdominal muscles. It's actually much deeper inside. So this is something that we will frequently work with our patients in order to teach them in the office. And there are, in fact, specially trained physical therapists who some of our patients will work with in order to learn the Kegels exercises as well. And there's also, for those of you who are very tech savvy, some new fancy schmancy home pelvic floor trainers that will buzz or send things to your phone if you're, when you're squeezing your muscles correctly and you can actually play games with them. It's very exciting and kind of interesting technology the, to look Xbox? at. The Xbox? Yeah. <laughs> it's an iPhone app, actually. <laughs> so there are lots of ways so that you can see if you're squeezing the right muscles and actually get objective data on how strong you're squeezing and see your, hopefully, your little curve go up and getting stronger and stronger. I've had a couple of patients who have done these home exercises and then see a physical therapist and their physical therapists are like, what have you been doing? Like this is so much better than anybody I've ever seen before. So um, it works, it, it, those things can be very helpful. So the person that asked that question sounds like you have an overactive bladder. You're one of those 33 million people that has the overactive bladder but without the incontinence and it, you know, it may eventually get to that if it worsens. Uh, I think you should get checked out, though, and make sure that there isn't some underlying condition. There isn't a bladder infection or, or something along those lines first. Do the Kegel exercises, of course, and uh, then see if there's something else that can be done, medications or some other procedure that can help. Here's another question. Sometimes I sneeze and I leak. Is that urinary incontinence? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a classic definition that's of stress incontinence. That's that type of incontinence where the kegels really w can help, and mm -hmm. if it doesn't, then maybe sort of some sort of surgical intervention. Medications don't work very well for that condition. Okay, Dr. Soleil's presentation it has um, you have presented the vaginal pessaries. 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 Um, are pessaries permanent? And uh, how often? There's actually a four-part series. Four-part question. Are pessaries um, permanent? How often removed? How does it affect intercourse, and how do you determine s shape and size? Ah, fantastic questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love pessaries because they're not permanent, and we can size them to the individual. So uh, again, a, a thing that I talk with my patients about is the same size six pair of pants isn't going to fit all of us, and the same size six pessary isn't going to fit all of us. So. In the beginning, it is a little bit of trial and error to find the pessary shape that will fit your body. And what I mean by fit your body is once the pessary is placed into the vagina, you don't know it's there. So you should be able to go about your business and not realize that the pessary is still in the vagina, and that's a good fit. As far as are they permanent, how long do they need to stay for? There are some women who are able to place and remove the pessary on their own. And so they'll place the pessary in the morning when they get up. They'll go about their daily business. At the end of the day, before they go to bed, they'll take it out. I have other patients who their physical dexterity is not quite adequate for them to be comfortable doing that, or they may just not be comfortable doing that, and they will come and see us every few months in order to take a look and make sure that the pessary is not causing any harm to the tissue in the vagina. It is placed into the vagina. They're a silicon device, so they do not absorb any fluids. They do not cause infections. However, they are there, and with constipation or other forms of pressure, they can rub against the skin and irritate. And for this reason, we like to see our patients on a periodic basis to make sure that the pessary is A, still fitting correctly, uh, and B, not causing any problems for it. And the last part to that question was, how does it affect sex? And that depends on the size and shape of the pessary that's used and whether or not the woman is comfortable uh, leaving the pessary in or removing it. 
certainly a number of my patients will leave the pessary in and will still be sexually active without any problems at all. Does alcohol affect urinary incontinence? Does coffee as well? Uh, yes, again, that, that simple answer. And they're both diuretics, meaning um, just like a water pill that you take, it makes you produce more urine than you would have otherwise. So, you know, a cup of coffee might make you pee out a cup and a half of, of water, of urine. So by increasing the, the urine output, you can overwhelm the bladder capacity. Uh, your bladder could only hold so much. So if you're, if you're peeing two cups of urine every half an hour, it's not because you have an overactive bladder, it's because you're producing too much urine. Um, and that's normal, your bladder just can't hold that much. So yes, drinking too much coffee and, or too much alcohol can, that's not necessarily harmful if you're not overdoing it, but it can aggravate an existing condition. Mm -hmm. If you have a small functional bladder capacity, overactive bladder, et cetera, the increased urine output means more leakage, more opportunity for leakage. So that's how they really affect it. I find that something that people overlook a lot is doing something like avoiding diary. It's very easy to do at home and just do it for one to two days. Keep track of everything you drink and keep track of every time you pee and keep track of every time you have a strong urge or leak. And that's really you know, all, there, all there is to it. But a lot of my patients will find that they don't have leaking at all, like my, my patient who was the beer aficionado. She, didn't, she was fine during the day, but nighttime was bad, and it was from the beer. Or people will a lot of people will find that they're, they're really having issues in the morning, and they realize, oh, wait a minute. It's every time I have a cup of coffee, then I, you know, I feel like I have to go to the bathroom every 15 minutes for a couple of hours. So doing a bladder diary is something that's very simple. You can do at home. You can just keep get a piece of paper and do it yourself or you can go online and there's lots of voiding diaries that you can find and download but it can really give you a lot of information it can also as dr soleil suggested it can show you if you're peeing a large amount every few every half hour or an hour that's something that is completely different and needs to be evaluated because that's a, a completely different situation I also find that sometimes if, uh, looking at when, when people are taking medications, mm -hmm. if you're taking your diuretic at bedtime and your, most of your symptoms are at night, that sometimes moving the medication and taking it in the morning if you're, uh, you know, your general medicine doctor is okay with that, that sometimes will improve their symptoms so you can sleep better at night. So <laughs> looking at the timing of medications um, as part of the history I think is an important thing to consider. I agree, the HCTZ is hydrochlorothiazide, that's diuretic, mm -hmm. and its job is to make you produce more urine. Uh, most of the time, it's best to take it in the morning because then you're closer to a bathroom and you're up and around anyway and it doesn't disturb your sleep. But I do have a patient who likes to take it at night. She doesn't mind getting up four or five times at night, but she finds that if she takes it in the daytime, it limits her activities and she, she has to know where all the bathrooms are. If she doesn't take it in the morning, then she can go out and meet her friends and go play cars or whatever. And so it's, it's, it's a choice. It's always a trade-off. But you have to get rid of that extra water. That's the reason you're taking it, to bring down your blood pressure, to get rid of the, the extra water in your, in your legs, to reduce the edema, the swelling. And uh, there's no way around that. It's going to produce more urine, and you're going to pee more often. Are there other exercises besides Kegel to treat urinary incontinence? Well, the Kegel is just kind of a general <clears throat> name. But, it, you know, when... For people who have more complex pelvic muscle issues, they're not able to actually isolate those. And as Dr. McDonald said, that's something that we actually try to help women to isolate those muscles in the office. Uh, physical therapy is helpful, and they can look at actually, you know, isolating specific muscles and try to get contractions in those areas. But we kind of use Kegel as like a, a catch-all for just pelvic floor muscle contractions. The main muscle that uh, you're contracting is the levator ani muscle, but there's a whole, there's a whole sling, kind of like a, a woven basket of muscles in the pelvis that are all involved. And as Dr. Slack mentioned earlier, the, the bladder retraining is another kind of exercise you do, where again, if you know your bladder is empty or nearly empty, you've just peed and you have the urge to go and you're not on a diuretic, and you know that if you go, you're only gonna pee half an ounce, there's no harm in holding it back. And if you resist that urge, the bladder will stop contracting, will give up, and that urge should go away. And maybe it takes just holding it for an extra five seconds before you get up and go, and then the next time, extend it up to 10, to then 30 seconds, then two minutes, until that urge finally goes away, and then, then you win. <laughs> the bladder will give up. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a way to deal with that. 
And a normal bladder capacity is about 500 cc's, but it can hold up to 1,000 cc's, so a liter of fluid. So a lot of people feel like if I don't go, my bladder is going to burst. It probably won't, okay? <laughs> so especially if you've gone to the bathroom in the last hour or so and you're not on a diuretic, you don't have some sort of diuresis issue, your, your bladder is not going to burst, you know, so pushing it to the limit may make you leak a little bit or you may, may dribble, so it may not be something you want to do when you're out and about, but if you're home and you're trying to do the bladder retraining, you're, you're not, you're, you're not going to explode. Try and see if you can get it just another 15 minutes. What I tell people is start, you know, at what, half hour, whatever you're comfortable with, half hour intervals, and if you're comfortable going every half hour, then try going for 45 minutes. Do that for a few days. When you're comfortable with that, go an hour. When you're comfortable with that, add 15 minutes each each time. And then within usually within a few weeks, most patients will get up to being able to void every two hours comfortably. So you know, time it and then just take control. Okay. And what is the name of the uh, Kegel app that's on the iPhone? It's actually a device. And I can, it's, there's several of them available if you look online or you go to certain, well, usually they sell them at most adult novelty stores, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I've done some research. But there's one uh, that I have used that's very user, that I've seen that's very user friendly, and I've had a few patients use it called LV, it's E L V I E, and you can go ELVIE.com. It's, it's basically it's a small egg-shaped device that is placed inside the vagina. It has a pressure transducer in it. So you, when you squeeze the muscles, it can detect the contraction. And then it has like, it's Bluetooth enabled and it goes to your phone, paired to your phone. And it's like a little game where you can like, you have to like blow up the little jewels with your, with your squeezes <laughs> and stuff like that. So it's, a, it's very sleekly done. Uh, it comes in a box that looks like an iPhone. It's very like nicely nicely done. So you can go online and look at those. They're, like I said, they're, they're not inexpensive. I think it's that one is around $200. But versus that doing, you know, that doing some like pelvic floor rehabilitation, you know, each session with a therapist, maybe $75 or $100. So some may, you know, kind of be weighing the options there. Okay. Are there other ways to heal or to treat incontinence? urinary incontinence, um, such as taking pills, or is there a laser treatment? Um, there's no la laser treatment as such. I think when a lot of people think say laser, they, they mean minimally invasive. The collagen injections or the bulking agent injections is done with a scope. So there's no cutting, there's no incisions. Um, that would be the closest one I could think of. But many of the other procedures that we mentioned are also very minimally invasive. And the pills, of course, yes, yeah, certainly there are pills for the urgent continence, not for the stress incontinence. Mm -hmm. And that's the list of pills that we had up there, the anticholinergics and Merbetric, the beta agonist, uh, for the overactive bladder and the urgent continence. Now, is there downtime in with the, the treatment option of urgent PC? No. No, there's no downtime. It's, I, I, as I was saying before, I kind of, a lot of my patients have really come to look at it as their me time, their spa time. They come, they, some of them, they bring a pillow, and they put their head back, they turn off the lights in the room, and they just go to sleep. Other uh, women will read. I have one woman who's, uh, she's almost knitted a full sweater. So, uh, you know, it's, th there's no downtime. There's, it, if any of you have ever had acupuncture, um, I've done the urgent PC to myself. I've had acupuncture before. It's, besides a, maybe a little zing kind of feeling, if, when, if you get directly into the nerve or when the stimulation just starts, it's very, very well tolerated and you know there's you can drive you can do cartwheels whatever <laughs> you want afterwards so a cystocele is when the bladder is dropping so if you I tell my patients think of the vagina like a box and if you have a cardboard box any of the sides can cave in the top the bottom the sides so when we talk about a cystocele the top is dropping, so that's the bladder. When we talk about a rectocele, the rectum, it's not dropping necessarily, but it's pushing into the vagina. And the sling procedure is used to support the urethra, which is, so the tube coming from the bladder out. 
So as Dr. Saleh mentioned in his pelvic floor uh, support issues that as, uh, anterior repair is to lift the, the cystocele, lift the bladder itself, and then the sling is to support the urethra. So, so often women will, who have a lot of prolapse issues have both. They have the bladder falling and the urethra is what we call unstable, and so they have a combination if, when they, if they decide to move forward with surgery where we l both lift the bladder and place a sling to help both with the bulge as well as with the incontinence. Thank you again, Dr. Saleh, Dr. Slack, and Dr. McDonald. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you for your Thanks, excellent everyone. questions.